so you guys have an M folder, don't you? Like a personal folder. Yeah. So if you could make um, a folder in there for this practical, that would be really good. Um, and then you can download the notes for the practical from this website here. So you should just be able to go into there and then uh, get those. So I'll just give you a second to do that. But ideally, what, what you should do while we're actually doing the practical is just make notes of the steps that you've taken and any images that you make and that kind of thing. So you, th this is a Word document which has the steps in for the practical. So you could actually make notes of the parameters and the images in there if you want to, or you can open up a separate document to do that. But either way, it, it's, it's good practice to actually make notes of what you've done. So then when you come to look at it, when you're revising or whatever, you'll be able to remember. Um, in terms of molecular epidemiology, you know, why, why do we want to do this? What's the point? Um, and there's a few different reasons why you might want to partake in molecular epidemiology. And in terms of disease, you might want to find out the distribution. Uh, so if you have an outbreak or something like that, you might want to find out where, how it's been transmitted or where it's come from. Or you might want to just know the nature of a particular uh, disease that you're looking at and the prevalence of it. And there's a variety of different ways that you can do molecular epidemiology. So there's uh, pulse field gel electrophoresis, uh, multi-locus sequence typing, and whole genome sequencing. And I'm going to elaborate on these, but they're basically different levels of resolution, if you like. So, OK, I'm not really a labby person. And to me, this looks quite scary. I don't know about you guys. but. So this is pulse field gel electrophoresis, and it's basically a fingerprint for a genome or a bacteria or a virus, whatever it is that you're looking at. And so what you want to do is uh, identify differences between your, your uh, bacteria or something like that. And so in this case, along the top are your different uh, bacteria that you're looking at, and then down the side here, are molecular weights. So what you do is you take your whole genome, you use a particular enzyme that breaks it up into different pieces, the enzyme does it at particular sites in the genome, and then you get these different sized chunks, you pop it onto a gel, and then it puts it, um, when you pass it through the gel, things stop at a different weight, and there's kind of an electro electrical current that goes backwards and forwards through the gel, and then these molecules of DNA gradually settle down into a particular place. And so you get these different sized chunks. These would be bigger chunks. These would be smaller chunks. And the idea is that different differences in the genome of the uh, bacteria that you're looking at would come up in this because you'd be getting different sizes of DNA, different chunks. So you can see here that most of them seem to share these big chunks of DNA but some of them have some differences. So you can see like this one has an extra chunk here. So that would be a kind of fingerprint. It's a way of fingerprinting your uh, bacteria. So it's a way of finding differences between them. So there are some limitations to this. Can anyone imagine what a limitation to this might be? Can you, can you guess? So if you're just chunk, chopping up chunks of DNA and you're looking at the size of it, it's possible that you could get two chunks of DNA that have different stuff in them, but they're the same size. And so they would come up as having the same fingerprint. So this is, this was, this is it's OK, but it's not ideal, because there's some ambiguity there. And different labs maybe use slightly different enzymes, so it might cut things slightly differently. And so if you're doing it multiple times from different labs, it's not very comparable either. Um, so then you have something called multi-locus sequence typing. So rather than looking at the whole genome, you select a few housekeeping genes. And housekeeping genes are genes that, say you have a particular uh, organism of interest. So I work on Staph aureus, so I'm going to be talking about Staphylococcus aureus a lot. But so if you work on a particular bacteria, it will have certain genes that all of that species have, and they're essential for that species. So they won't get any mutations that delete the gene or anything like that, because they're housekeeping genes. They're absolutely essential. And so they tend to uh, have a, a slower mutation rate. And so what you do is you take a few of these housekeeping genes. It's normally 
six to eight, and you just look at the, some internal fragments of these genes. So if you imagine that you had gene A, okay, and it, if each of these is a different uh, organism of the same species, so a different strain of the same species, you can see that there's slight mutations, so slight differences within this gene. It's the same gene, it's just slightly different between the different strains of bacteria that you're looking at. And so we call these allelic variants. And so you use this to look at how perhaps how the bacteria have evolved and how they've diversified. So in Staphylococcus aureus, there are seven uh, genes that are used for multi locus sequence typing. As I say, it tends to be between six and eight, depending on the species that you look at. And so for each of these would be an allelic variant of this particular gene. So you can see sequence type one, they have allelic variant one for all seven genes. And then sequence type two, it has allelic variant one for all genes except for this one. And so because it only has one variant difference, we call this a single locus variant of one. And then this would be a double locus variant because it has two differences from this. But three would be a single locus variant of number two. And so if you were to make a tree of this, th these would be more closely related to each other than perhaps this one, which is a quadruple locus variant, quintuple locus variant of one. Um, and with these, with the multi-locus sequence typing, you can actually take it one step further. So you can look at the <coughs> population of a particular species that you're interested in um, based on their multi-locus sequence type. And so you have to, um, it helps you understand the population structure. So is, is the population of bacteria that you're looking at really clonal or is it, is it really diverse? So if you look here, you know, I initially was talking about sequence type one and then you had these other ones coming off. So these would be single locus variants of sequence type one, which means that they share all of the same allele allelic variants except for one. And so the size of this, we're going to come to these diagrams in a second, but the size of this uh, indicates the frequency that you find a particular sequence type. So sequence type one is very frequent and perhaps the other ones are quite rare. And these mutations that you see in the uh, allelic variants, so in those, in those parts that we're looking at, are what dictates what these sequence types are. So you can see here, like I was saying, so you've got your founding genotype and then a single locus variant. And then if it's two differences in this, so like this one from this one, that would be a double locus variant. So if you go to your practical notebook now that you've downloaded, uh, we can have a go at the first practical and see how you get on. <coughs> 